Thank you. Well, on behalf of the College of Ag Environmental Sciences and the University of Georgia, we welcome you to this conversation with Chef Lydia Vasianich. A life of love, family, and food. If you don't know about her, she has quite a story and quite a history. She's an Emmy award-winning public television host, best-selling author, a successful restaurateur, and owner of a flourishing food and entertainment business. She is a founding member of Women's Chefs and Restaurants. She's also a champion for the United Nations Association of the United States of America Adopt a Future program in support of refugee education. We're so delighted to have you here today. It's quite my, an honor. Oh, my pleasure, Dean. Thank you. And Thank you for a, having me. This is a conversation. And so I will ask the questions, and uh, she will uh, give us her, her impressions. And then there'll be an opportunity for have some, some audience questions as well. Are you ready? OK. First question, Lydia. Your, your cookbooks have all felt so personal. Uh, you've done this so well. But now you're writing a memoir. Why write that memoir now? Uh, well, uh, it's actually my publisher that, uh, <laughs> you know, I always thought I'm a, a chef. And uh, uh, you know, what I communicate is food and recipes, uh, whether in restaurants or on television. And you know, a recipe book was a natural. And I thought that that's what people wanted. But I think as, as you become part of, uh, of people out there, societies, of homes, uh, they feel more and more connected to you, to your food. And they want to know more and more about you as a person and what made you what you are. Um, mine is an interesting story, because uh, I am a refugee. Uh, I came to the United States. I was 12 years old as a refugee. So maybe I'll explain the, the geographical positioning of all of what happened. I was born in a part of Italy. If you're looking at Italy, Italy has 20 regions. And in the right-hand corner, by Venice and whatever, there's a little peninsula called Istria. Istria now belongs to Croatia. But Istria, in part of the Dalmatian coast, was Italian. Uh, Italy uh, was on the losing part of the war. And uh, ultimately, uh, that part uh, was given by the Paris Treaty of 1947 to the newly formed communist Yugoslavia. We were ethnic Italian. I was just born in that period, so it was kind of, uh, uh, we got caught because there was an allowance between 44, the war ended in 44, and 47, there was three years where the Allied forces uh, and uh, the English forces occupied that territory to keep peace. You know, it's not unlike what's going on today in different border terror situations and whatever. And, uh, and so for, for, from 44 to 47, that was sort of kept quiet until uh, the border was decided. In 1947, the Paris Treaty decided the border, and it was down Trieste. Trieste remained Italian. And up in, uh, Istria and the whole Dalmatian coast was given to the newly formed communist Yugoslavia. Um, we were caught behind. There was, a, there was a, an allowance in those three years. There was a big exodus. Actually, it was 300,000 ethnic Italians that exited it from Istria and Dalmatia back into Italy and into the world. Uh, but. Uh, I was born, we, we remained, the Iron Curtain went up, and we were caught behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, being ethnic Italian, you know, communism went on, so we couldn't speak Italian. We couldn't practice our religion. Um, my father was a, a mechanic, and he had a little business. He had two trucks. They deemed him a capitalist, took the trucks, put them in jail. And so things were really building, building up. And ultimately, uh, uh, my parents decided that maybe we should move on. But we literally had to escape in order, because you couldn't leave a communist country. Uh, at least you couldn't leave Yugoslavia. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll just explain a little bit, because on the other side of the border, we had family also. The border went down. Part of the family was on one side, and the other part was on the other side. And uh, so my mother, my brother, and I 
went supposedly to visit a sick aunt on the Italian side because they wouldn't allow the whole family. My, ha my father had to remain as a hostage and then ultimately he literally escaped the border and joined us in Italy and that was in 1956. Uh, and um, uh, coming to, to, should I go on with my story? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> coming coming to, to Italy, um, uh, as you know, because we now our names were changed, they changed names. Uh, from Maticchio, it became Motica, very Slavic. And um, uh, we had a visa for whatever, 10 days. And then uh, uh, my father escaped literally and arrived without any papers. So we were uh, a danger, uh, we couldn't remain because if we were caught, we would be repatriated. So uh, we, uh, my parents decided to register with the local police, asked for asylum, and we ended up in, in a political camp refugee in Trieste for two years. The, the, the refugee now is in a museum. If you go in there, uh, it's San Saba. It was called, uh, still is San Saba, it's a museum. And prior to being a political uh, uh, refugee camp, it was the Nazi concentration camp. So, you know, the, the whole uh, uh, trip uh, was a little bit uh, shocked. But then, in 1958, Dwight Eisenhower was the president, and he opened the immigration for people fleeing communism. And we came to the United States in 1958. So you were a very young child when you met I was happened. 12, I was 12. And, you know, it was a big blessing, I mean, an opportunity. Um, to, to, to have a life, to have an education. And, you know, in retrospect, you look and I go back and all that, there's no place in the world that I could have had the opportunity that I had, that I have in the United States. So how did that experience shape your, your outlook, your hope, your ambition, your sense of where you wanted to be? Well, you know, being young, the, the, and the, the emphasis was on, on education and becoming American. Uh, I, we didn't speak English, of course, but as children, we were sharing this. Uh, as children, it takes you about a year at that age to pick up the language, sort of, and, and be able to converse. And uh, you do become sort of the, the spokespeople, persons, my brother and I, for the family. And uh, so, uh, you know, I think that uh, that taught me a lot. But all I could think about is becoming American. And when I was 18, uh, as soon as I was 18, I went for my citizenship. I wanted to make sure that I had a, a home, that I had a place to live. And, uh, you know, uh, I feel uh, more American than anything else now. But you also travel back sometimes? I travel back often. I travel back often because um, uh, there's there's uh, there's a there's a pull, and also there's I chose as my career to actually be the 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 conductor, if you will, or the conduit between two cultures, my native culture Italian, and my new adaptive culture American, and uh, uh, I'll go back to how cooking came into my life, so. Going back into Istria under communism, my mother put my brother and myself with grandma, uh, a little town outside the big city, because in the city you had the police, the secret police and all of that, checking everybody's move. But uh, with grandma, we were free. Grandma, we spoke Italian. Sometimes grandma snuck us in church, uh, where in the city it couldn't happen. Uh, but grandma was in charge in a sense of providing food for the whole family, not just my family, but uh, uh, the extended family that was there. And so the setting was, was just, just wonderful, you know. It was a courtyard, we had chickens, we had ducks, uh, you know, we had goats, uh, we had uh, pigs, we had two pigs. November was the slaughter, we made prosciutto, we made sausages, we made everything, blood sausages, I remember. We had a certain amount of olives, November again is the harvest of the olives. I remember making the olive oil, uh, September the wine, grandpa. So I, was, I grew up in a, in, a, in a setting very closely connected to food and the 
growing, the raising, the making of food. Of course, she had a garden, so you know I would help her with the garden, with the harvest. Uh, I would uh, go to the market with her. Whenever she had some excess, uh, she would go to the market to make some money to buy salt or whatever else uh, she needed. And so becoming also a little uh, merchant, if you will. Uh, but uh, it, 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 uh, I understood food and I appreciated food and the smells and of, of, of rosemary or bay leaves of the perfect ripe fig of the perfectly ripe tomatoes. They're all so vivid still in my mind. Uh, and I think those are the basis of, of my passion for food and for cooking. Uh, but also for nurturing, because uh, you know, food was the giver of life, and it was the one element that it was most important in growing up, growing, uh, making food, respecting food, uh, um, not wasting food, everything. I mean, when we went to the market, we would uh, whatever grandma had left over, because you know, at eleven o'clock. In, 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 Europe, in Italy in that time, that now was Yugoslavia, the women went home and cooked lunch. Lunch was at 12, 1. So the market closed at 11 o'clock, 11 something. So if grandma had anything left, there was a little trattoria on the corner, and I would get ice cream, that was my treat, but she would barter whatever vegetables she had left because the trattoria would actually collect all the scrapings from the plates, the, the breads, everything in this big bin. And we would take it home. And then we would cook that for the pigs. You know, I think the pigs have a sensitive stomach. Mm -hmm. And uh, you would need to boil it to so make sure there's no bacteria. But we would cook for the pigs in this big, uh, it was the, uh, on an open fire with the wood. So everything was recycled. Everything was used to the last. Uh, and, and that's my uh, rooting for uh, the roots for the appreciation and the knowledge of food. What really brought it home for me was that when my father came, escaped to Trieste, I did not know, my brother and I did not know that we're not going back because of course you don't tell the children. No, no. And uh, uh, when he came and soon enough realized that I wasn't going back, um, I think um, the, the, I felt like, you know, unfinished business. I didn't say goodbye to my grandmother, to my goats, to my whatever. And uh, I think that food remained my connector. The aromas, the flavors of the food that I cooked brought me back to grandma. And I always try to, to kind of um, get to that point of those uh, aromas that I remember and the flavor. And I continued to kind of uh, uh, satisfy myself and my longing but also uh, food is uh, the connector that I continued with my whole life. Still to this day, this is how I connect, by cooking for somebody, by preparing food. And you know, I think it's one of the major and the basic connector for all of us, because whatever your culture is, we all eat, we all share food, and we are all nurtured with food. So you traveled across the border by train. We did. But your father, walked across. He did. And quite an experience, wasn't it? Well, yes, because, you know, uh, uh, the, the border was uh, uh, guarded. They had uh, scent dogs. They had uh, the, the, the army going up and down. And so he was shot at. Oh. And uh, uh, he, he made it, though. He made it, finally made it across and walked his way. And he walked about uh, 120 kilometers. You're glad to see him. We were, yeah, it was the middle of the night, I remember. You, you were in Grandma, and so uh, my great aunt and with my mother, and you know, in the middle of the night, I, we heard them crying and whatever, and kids got up, the two of us, and there was my father. He had already, he had really collapsed on, on the floor. But you know, he, he, he pulled himself together, and we were together again as a family. That was important, yeah. so we had the whole, new adventure of where to now. So there were, there were some people there that helped you along the way, that made it possible for you to come to America. Do, do any of those stand out to you? Well, uh, yeah, it, it was, uh, you know, I think that uh, in our trip or, or track to, to come here, there was many people that helped us along the way. We, we, we didn't have the economical means. 
at that point. Um, the, in the aftermath of the war, I think the, the Vatican, uh, the Catholic Relief Services, committed to taking care of refugees. And uh, they took care of us in camp, all, all of them in the camp, but I remember specifically for us. So they provided us with, the, with the, an opportunity and a trip and paid the trip for us to come to America. And when we came here, we had nobody here, and of course, uh, you know, where to go. We, we were put in the hands of the Catholic Relief Services here, and they took care of us. They put us in a hotel, and we would go regularly to the social worker who spoke Italian to my mother, and, uh, uh, and they, would, they, they supplied us with, 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 uh, uh, with uh, some uh, money, a budget, to eat while they found eventually a job for my father and a home in, in New Jersey, I remember. So that took a few, a few weeks. So when you came over, your mother was asked to bring a child, an orphan, with her. Is that right? Uh, yes, when, when we were in Rome. So we were in Trieste, from Trieste. I must say that, you know, we had two years of uh, a, a very thorough wedding, wedding program. Okay. So we went to Genova for help lines, for they tracked our, our records, providing, because in those days you never knew, I guess much like what's happening today. Is, uh, is there a spy involved? Is there other uh, things going on? So I remember being vetted, even as children, you know, quarantined. Mm. Uh, I mean, my mother and I were put in a room, quarantined away from my father and my brother. And uh, literally, you know, they derobed you, disinfected you, the whole thing. It was a bit invasive, especially if you're, if you're 10 years old. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, not being separated from my brother and my father. And we were put in this little, it looked like a little dark room, it was almost like a prison. And we had two bunk beds, and I had the windows, and I would always look out of the window. We were in there for uh, three days, two and a half, three days. Remember looking out if I would see my father and my brother, because I was afraid that I would not see them again. Uh, but after this, this thorough process of vetting, we ultimately were brought down to Rome. And at that point, at that time, was the Ciampino uh, Airport, was the big airport. And there was a, a group of, uh, I would say, about 40 immigrants. And uh, when, when we were ready to leave, uh, a woman, actually, with the, the Red Cross outfit, came to my mother, and she said, you're a, a teacher? And my mother said, yes, uh, she, was, she, is, she was an elementary school teacher. And she said, we have a child that needs to go to America for adoption. And his name was Gianfranco, I remember. And they asked that, would you, would you be kind enough to take care of him until we get to New York? And there, the Red Cross will come and get him. And uh, at the end, they even paid her a little bit. And she almost didn't want, she didn't want to take it. But I remember uh, this, uh, he must have been um, maybe 10, 10 months old, oh. uh, was an adorable Gianfranco. Often I think where he ended up, but we, I'm sure, I hope he's in a happy home. He should be a full-grown adult by now. <laughs> <laughs> so when you first came to New York, what were your impressions? What was the, your call? Well, we first came to JFK. Uh, it was Idlewild Airport there. And you know, just kind of landing, and uh, you see in the distance, I mean, we were all over the windows. You see in the distance uh, these, these spikes. And then we had this, the yellow buses waiting for us, which were the school buses, uh, you know, I gather. And uh, they took us to, uh, to New York. And coming from the airport through to New York, you're getting closer and closer, and then the bridge, and then you finally get close. Uh, my brother and I was just overwhelmed, but there was other kids too, and I mean, you know, it was uh, very exciting. And so uh, I recall you talking about the uh, the food the, f the food machine the, the automat. Oh, oh well, that's... they put us they put us in a hotel on 36th Street, I think it was, and uh, uh, there we would visit the social worker, and uh, uh, we would sort of be be allowed to go around the block because my mother didn't Mark. allow us. But uh, um, initially, uh, they give you a budget, and my mother. Uh, uh, was kind of frugal. She she didn't want it. She says, "This is money I have to return. When will I have money?" And uh, our menu was for the first week was 
Wonder Bread, milk, and bananas. <laughs> she, she figured we had, we had a balance there between the fruit and the... And, uh, and then when the next week she came to the social worker and the social worker, well, how did it go? And we explained. And she said, well, you need money to feed the children while we still look for the job. And my mother pulled up. She said, no, no, I have money left. I don't need any more money. And uh, she said, no, no, no. You have to feed these children. You have to spend the money. Don't worry, we, we wanted you, we invited you to be Americans, and we want you to take care. And do you know that my mother kept track of all the money she got? And we went back after they found the job and we settled, and she, we went back after a year with the social worker to, to they would check on us how it was going. And my mother had the money that they gave us all ready to give back. Oh. She had it all. And they didn't accept it. They said, no, spend it on the children. But you know, that kind of gratitude and responsibility. And your, your mother's still with us? My mother, she's 98. She 98. still lives with, she lives with me. You, those of you that watch the television, see her. Uh, and uh, there's the new episodes coming now in October out. She's in them as well. Uh, she still has all her faculties. She's great. She has little difficulties in walking. But she will want to know everything that happened on this trip. <laughs> <laughs> so does she remember when you we snuck things in the food food cart as you're going through the store? Well, <laughs> it's shopping, you know, you're shopping and don't speak the language. I remember when we first had our our apartment and we went shopping. Of course, you know, first you kind of look by the pictures or by the smell and whatever you realize. Uh, the vegetables, especially the boxes and all of that, uh, you, you didn't know. So, uh, of course, again, uh, she didn't allow us to, to buy chocolates or whatever, but we snuck it in. Uh, she, she, she didn't know the, the, the difference that was there. But uh, one of the most, uh, because she ended up working in a factory uh, as a seamstress because she didn't speak English. My father, they found a job as a mechanic at a Chevrolet plant. Mm -hmm. He actually was installing radios at that time. So, uh, And uh, um, I would be at home uh, from school and whatever, and she would leave everything for me. You know, the beans are soaking, the potatoes, uh, all basic food. None of this is just basic soups, lots of soups, lots of uh, chicken wings, chicken necks, uh, all of that, oxtails, all of that made into soup, and then you have the, the meat with it. Uh, uh, frugal yet, yet nourishing. But uh, uh, I found out uh, Duncan Hines cake mix. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't believe myself that just by putting an egg or so, a little butter or something, and I had this wonderful cake. So we had a lot of desserts uh, at those dinners. <laughs> I recall we talked about the respect that you have for for nature and for animals and the environment? Or was this something you, you learned as a ch child uh, to appreciate the? Uh, I, I can't help but think that that is being, being, being raised, you know, uh, with uh, the importance of coexisting the animals, of taking care of them, and ultimately they return by nurturing and feeding us, you know, uh, feeding the chickens, collecting the eggs, of course. And then on a Sunday, uh, you know, the small courtyard animals were mostly the ones that were eating either a chicken or a rabbit. But a Sunday, you know, a chicken grandma would grab a chicken on Saturday, begin, I would bring the hot water to pluck it, <laughs> to cut the, the head off. And, and, uh, and then the, 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 I remember cutting the nails off, washing it good because the feet went into making soup and the neck and the wings. And, um, uh, uh, you know, I remember, she would open the chicken, and you know, this is still so vivid, and when uh, the, 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 the stomach, the liver, the heart, the stomach, you have to clean well, and it's tough. And as you open the chicken, all the unborn eggs, you know, like, like uh, the, the ovaries and the small, the eggs sometimes were as small as a, a blueberry, even smaller, and then up to, you know, a whole cluster, up to uh, uh, full grown eggs, and even the hard eggs. She would collect all of that. The intestines was my job to, she would pull out the intestine to clean the intestines, then cut them in half, then soak them in water and vinegar, wash them well, and 
we ate them. That was part of the frittata. Nothing was wasted. Right. So you know, it's it's that connection to the animals that we we that I loved. You know, the the kid goats. I always had a pet, but you know, uh, and they're usually in the springtime. Easter came along. I mean, mm. roasted with some potatoes and rosemary. <laughs> you know, and and you kind of you kind of understood that. You understood the connection. Uh, between uh, animals, and I think you respect animals more because they give you substance. So you think that that's a lost, that mindset has been lost today? People don't really know where? I, I think that the connection, especially to children, I mean, there was a uh, whole two generations that were disconnected from the source of food uh, mm -hmm. and uh, not knowing what it takes to raise animals or, or what they mean is not respecting the use of them, and not also an understanding of the environment, how important it is to take care of the environment so that we can all continue to coexist. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, that's when, when I had an invitation here, I thought, that's great. What's going on It's great, this connection, you know, a 360 degree connection to, to food, the source, the growth, the, then the, the, the Curing of it, the, the you know the extending, extending. We had, uh, you know, we did the curing of all the pork products. That's for the whole year. We rendered the lard. Uh, we we dried the figs, even raisins. You know, my fa my grandfather would would take the big clusters and you know the tea where they were attached to the thing, and in the cantina he had nails and he would hang the the whole cluster of grape there and there's always a cross ventilation and it would turn into raisin. Of course, it was you know brown or oxidized because it didn't have all the sulfur mm. and all the preservatives that we have today. But uh, uh, fix the same, Christmas came. That was our desserts, our treats, you know, mm. the dried figs where there was prune made into, into uh, uh, the, the, the strudels. The, uh, and and uh, so the connection to, 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 to food and the respect, and uh, um, I, I think it, it skipped about two generations. Yeah. But there's a conscious return. And, and it's wonderful to see that here and now with, with the new program, the hospitality mm -hmm. program, mm -hmm. maybe tying it ever more with the kind of uh, mm -hmm. Growing and uh, animal husbandry and all of that, butchering. Mm -hmm. So somewhere along the line, you you had you decided to go into the restaurant uh, business. So what what inspired you or what? Right, I you know the fact that I loved cooking and that I had that passion for for it 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 kind of uh, gratified me, brought me the emotions that maybe uh, I felt were taken away by by leaving and being pulled out of the situation. But uh, um, I, I didn't think that I was going to be a chef. Right. I, 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 I rather liked the sciences uh, of it. But then I met my husband, who was also uh, an immigrant. And he was in the restaurant industry. He was in the front of the house. And he always wanted to open his little restaurant. And ultimately, uh, you know, we got married. And uh, he did. In 1971, we opened his the first restaurant, Bonavilla, was nine, uh, nine tables. And I said, by then, by then we had one child that says, I'll help you. Okay. And so, uh, uh, you know, I went in, but we hired a chef. And, uh, you know, we had uh, uh, a staff. But I soon realized that I, you know, when, when I would make a dish and, and cook it, people liked that. So I said, well, I have to really get into this and learn. So I went into the kitchen, became the sous chef. And for 10 years, I worked with the, the chef. Uh -huh. and, uh, and by then, we had already two restaurants. We were successful. And then we sold those two restaurants and opened Felidia yeah. uh, in 1981. And that's where I became the chef. But by then, I had uh, the, the, the years in the kitchen as a sous chef. I realized how much I needed to learn, went back to Italy, uh, worked with mentors, with chefs that I really uh, admired in, in Italy. Uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, I, you know, in 81, I think I, was, I felt, OK, we can open a restaurant. And I could be the chef. But it wasn't a big restaurant anyway. But it, it had uh, 70 people. 
uh, could sit on it. And that's where kind of uh, I said, well, the first chef that we hired cooked Italian-American food. Italian-American food is a food that is based in the Italian culture, but it's not the food that you find in Italy. It's a food mm. of the, the adaptation, I would say, of the, of, the, of the immigrants adapting with the memories that they had and the food that they found, and the food that they found, the products that they found. Um, so, uh, and, and that was successful, and it still is a delicious cuisine. I think it's a venerable cuisine. You know, it really shows how uh, one can adapt to uh, the flavors, the memories, to products that you find. But I said, you know, by 81, a lot of the things were being imported from Italy, mm. and uh, I had a lot of the traditional products. And uh, um, I said, you know, I want to cook the food that we eat at home the cook that one eats in Italy, the original cook of Italy. And I think, uh, you know, it wasn't a major plan on my part as far as marketing, but that's what captured okay. the, the, the journalists uh, that came, what, what is, first of all, this young woman cooking Italian food, being a chef, you know, there was kind of, I was all out of uh, uh, their, their kind of, uh, uh, the profile, profile. Of, a, of a chef <laughs> of those days. Uh, I, I defied uh, all of those, but you know, in Italy, women are in the kitchen. In Italy, Italian trattorias, you go, now you find still women in the kitchen, the wives cook, the men kind of, uh, the wine and, and uh, so, so it's still, for me, it was a, 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 a normal place to be, but the press found it very, uh, and then I am a kind of a curious individual, you know, I, I went on, I uh, did research, uh, continued research in the Italian, but also in the, in the, the science of food, the, 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 the story, anthropology, the different cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, I think my, uh, uh, if one would say, how did you move on into books and, and live and, and TV, well, books, after we had opened uh, Felidia, Jay Jacobs was a writer for the Gourmet magazine. And he came in and he wrote a great article on, on Felidia and myself, you know. And um, uh, it was really a, a wonderful, he captured. He would sit, sit me down for hours and talk to me about this and talk to me about that. And ultimately, after the article came, and of course this all increased the the popularity of the restaurant. He said, Lydia, you should write a cookbook. And I says, well, you know, I'm not a writer, you know. He said, let's do it together. And my first cookbook was a collaboration because, you know, I knew what I knew and I knew what I didn't know. Uh, we wrote uh, La Cucina di Lydia, that was in 1990. And that was my first book. And I learned a lot through him, through the editors that, you know, against uh, the editor leads you into, in, uh, and that was my first book. But also in that first year, uh, Julia Child and James Beard came in the restaurant to kind of see what is this woman doing. And she was interested in my risotto, the mushroom risotto. Risotto was not as common as it is now. And she wanted to learn how to make risotto. Uh, we became friends, she came to the house. She ultimately invited me to be on her show. We did two episodes the Master Chef series, sometimes PBS still runs it. Oh, oh, and uh, and uh, the producer says, Lydia, you're pretty good, how about a show of your own? And this, so, so in, in, in my uh, evolution, um, there were a lot of opportunities, and I told the young students uh, of, the, of the department, uh, you know, you, you have to analyze the opportunities when they come, they come and you have to analyze it. Can, do, do you want to do it? Are you capable of doing it? That's number one. Otherwise, you need to prepare it, and you need to take that chance. You need to take the opportunity. Not every opportunity works. Uh, so, so these were opportunities that came along that I took and decided, but you know, with an opportunity and I continue, you need to dedicate it, dedicate it. Of course, I have to ask you this. It's not on the script. Uh, uh, what do you think of Southern cooking, Southern food? You know, I love it. I love it because it's, it's, it's a food 
of, of home, of comfort. Of, yeah. It evokes, I think, the sel same emotions when I speak to people and what they cook, and especially, uh, oh, Lydia, you have to come uh, uh, for, down for southern food and southern, and southern comfort or southern, uh, southern hospitality and all that. And I do, I sense that every time. That, and I think of, of, of America as, as a, uh, uh, its own uh, cuisine footprint, that the southern food is the strongest. And that's including maybe Creole, New Orleans, and all of that. Because, uh, yes, Michigan up there, there's the Indian, there's the wild rice, and there's a lot of fruits. Um, up uh, in, in, in the eastern coast, there's a, a lot of the, the fish uh, 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 cuisine and all of that. But I think as a, as a real kind of home cooking cuisine, that southern cooking has the biggest imprint in America. Well, we, we, we talked earlier that sometimes food is seen as the enemy. Don't eat this, can't eat that, this will cause this. So your, your thoughts were that maybe food is actually life. It's, it should be seen as good and not dangerous. Yes, and, yes. I think, I think that you know, food has been maligned. Maligned. Everything that is wrong with us, they trace back to food. How about turning it around? Didn't, uh, uh, who said Aristotle? Food is medicine. Food is the element that could keep you well. You have to understand it. It has to be the right kind of food. And you have to uh, use it judiciously. judiciously. Uh, okay? And so that has to change, I think, in the American approach to food and, and the philosophy of food is that food is still not, you know, it's, it's not good for you. Instead, it's quite the opposite. We need to take that mentality. Because we all enjoy it, we all live it, we all uh, love it. And uh, uh, I think that, you know, but I think we're getting there with the understanding of food and uh, the nutritional values and the balancing of food. And I think in order to really make that uh, work, we need to get out of the clutches of big industry oh. making food. Yeah. So are you, uh, are you uh, gluten-free? No. <laughs> Just no. kidding. <laughs> I had to ask that. that. Uh, so many of our students were curious about the restaurant industry, uh, going into the industry, taking that chance. Having been there, what, what advice could you give them about if you wanted to get started in the restaurant, what, do you, what should you be aware of? Well, it's a tough industry. Uh, it's an industry that require a lot of, uh, requires a lot of hours, a lot of commitment. You need to have a lot of passion, uh, and you need, but if you really want to do that, the one thing that needs to be done is that you need to prepare yourself well for the job. And also talking to, to women chefs, you know, uh, the question is always, as a, as a, as a woman, you know, uh, one, they feel a lot that they're not being treated equal. I, you know, and I helped to find two women's organizations addressing certain issues with women's problem. And uh, I, I, I do not connect with this kind of, uh, oh, you have to consider your job as a professional. Leave gender out of it. Get yourself prepared as good as you can and continue to educate yourself. Continue, it's a continuous, because it's a growth. Uh, and when you reach a certain position in a restaurant and you're known, all, there's certain things that are expected from you to be a leader, to bring new ideas. So what, what I would recommend is that you get a, a great education. Want to educate yourself, your soul, what you like, if you like, you know, so that you are complete and satisfied. And then you go into the specialization of, of hospitality or, or uh, culinary schools or whatever. What is very important is that you are being mentored. Mentoring is an extremely important because our industry is all about taking from others and making your own. I mean, uh, uh, Italy has, has a great culture of mentoring. Here, uh, I've been doing some research, it's not that, that much, so you need to find the chefs or work or whatever industry or restaurant owners that you admire. And you need to get close to those people. You need to make a, a, a beeline and you need to get there. And, and I can tell you that 
uh, these people that are in that position uh, are open to there's we, we love mentoring we love connecting and you know you go and you show your your enthusiasm and let me tell you 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 need to go I, I, I work for free just get in there Although evidently, eventually you will get paid and whatever, that's not the case. But you opened the door. You know, I did so many uh, uh, fundraising events uh, because there you're with other chefs and all that, and you get to know the connection and all of that. So you have to, and when you feel that you have all you wanted from that mentor, move on. That's the time for you to move on. Move on different if you want to into management. Uh, big hotels, luxury hotels, uh, cruise ships, travel the world, get to know other cultures. The world is so small uh, now that you need to appreciate your clients are from all different cultures. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, I know that uh, when I get uh, uh, Japanese clients, they, might, they love fish and they love their pasta, you know, the, uh, the smooth uh, pasta with fish sauces. Right. So, you know, you have to know what your Customers, even though you give them, I give them Italian, but I can kind of please them in what they like in my way. Mm -hmm. And so that's all important for you to be a successful restaurateur, hotelier, uh, or whatever. And, and, and it's, uh, it's about food, but it's also about an experience, setting the right experience, the right decor, the right, you know. And you have to have also a value element. You have to make sure that you deliver value, that if they pay X amount for the, they get, and what those value consist of in a restaurant? Many things, certainly the prime products, the preparation, the environment, the servers. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, do you have truffles shaven on your, uh, or, so all of that, but you have to have a sense of delivered value. The, the, the consumer is very well educated and, you know, knows the difference. I believe we have a few time for some questions from the audience. Um, yes. Please. Oh, the, oh, sorry. Please, yeah. Um, if, if first, I want to congratulate you. We have the microphone for you. Go ahead. Oh, thanks. First, I want to congratulate you on your choice of colors. Red and black is always welcome. <laughs> on, the, on the what? Choice of colors. Oh. You like my colors? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sacred. Basic, when you travel, basic black, women know that. And I, you someone will scarf, explain to you, you later. You change the scarf or whatever is on top. I want to follow up on a point that you touched on, and, and maybe I'm pushing back on you a little bit, but uh, you, you combine two elements. First, you said that uh, we need to not be uh, afraid of food and view food as a danger, and then you followed that uh, with the comment that it's important for us to move away from the industrialization of food. So I, I think your first point is uh, indisputable. I'm interested in um, your candid uh, optimism or pessimism about the ability of human society and in particular industrialized societies like the US uh, to stop what has happened across the last okay. 70 to 100 years with the industrialization, not only of our food production, but of you know, the food delivery mm. to the masses. Mm. Uh, yes, it, it's, it's inevitable that we need quantity of food, especially with the population growing. We need the facility with the big, big uh, urban areas, you know, not everybody has a, a farm market right next door. So it's inevitable that we need help in the production and of food. But let's go just uh, back. I think that the takeover of industry of food happened uh, when the industrial revolution sort of began and women went to the workplace and uh, the, the cooking or the preparing or the facilitating of having cooked food was delegated to big industry. And that was accepted uh, uh, well because, you know, the women were freer and they just unpacked or frozen or TV dinner. I think that, you know, i just make a little back step here. I recall when I came to, the Amer to America, I wanted to be American. 
I wanted to eat a TV dinner. My mother <laughs> wouldn't allow it. So, you know, at that time, even to furnish our home, we would take things off the streets if there was something good. So I remember that I picked up, you know, this little open trays that you opened in the metal trays? And I remember it was black with pink flowers and whatever. <laughs> I washed it well. I bought uh, uh, with my own money because I began to work as a sales girl in a bakery. My TV dinner. I <laughs> heated up. I put myself in front of television. I put the TV dinner from the tin and I was American. <laughs> so, so, so going back, that's what it was. But uh, the food industry is the second largest employer in the United States. So, you know, you just can't block the wheels of such a, a strong going train to make changes because it wouldn't work. A lot of people have their jobs. So it has to be a slow process of education, I think, which is happening. Uh, I think of, of uh, some legislation uh, which is happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think that the, 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 the real uh, task is in the hands of the consumer. Uh, an educated consumer can really turn, it won't be a fast turn, but it, it will be a turn. If the consumer puts the money in the right places and buys, the right products. And the right products, you know, organic doesn't sig signify anything, but check, check about hormones and humanely grown and all of this uh, kind of production. And it could be a big production. I, you know, it doesn't, a small production doesn't uh, 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 guarantee the perfect production. It could be a big, as long as it follows the, the needs the nutritional needs uh, of, of us and, and the environment. So the cons consumer, an educated consumer, young people going out and leading on on this, it will take a, a, a few years. But I think that if the consumer goes out there and buys the right product and uses, is conscious about it, because buying uh, uh, artisanal products and vegetables cost a little more. You, you get much more flavor out of them. And uh, I think gratification as a, as a chef and as a, uh, and it, it, uh, uh, but it costs a little more. But in the long run, uh, the results are, and maybe a consciousness in the same cycle of not wasting so much. If you pay a little more of this, you respect it more and so on. It's a whole chain of events. I think that it's really with all the help from all the institutions in the hands of the consumer. We have some students here as well. I, I wanted to give them an opportunity to ask a question. Yeah, please. Hi. Hi. Um, being an immigrant and a refugee, how do you feel about like the recent turn in our culture towards kind of the ostracism, like the hate of people who were in the situation you were when you moved to America? So I think I heard the last part, but being a refugee and how do I feel, how the refugees are being treated and the AIDS. Uh, you know, uh, I, I was one of the recipients. I am a result, I am a product of being helped, somebody that helped me, somebody that cared, somebody that accepted us, and ultimately the opportunities that came with that. Um, but I also believe that refugees, as refugees, we have a responsibility. Uh, I think that it was uh, uh, the vetting that we got, uh, you know, as, a, as I looked in retrospect, it was maybe those dark moments as a child, but I, I respected that because, you know, I was being invited in a home and they didn't know me. Mm. So I respect that. And uh, I, I also think that as refugees, we have a responsibility to give back, to give back to the country to the best of our capabilities. And that means, you know, rolling up your sleeves, taking the opportunities, making it happen, and give back along the way to the country mm -hmm. by living well, by, you know, respecting the environment, the, everything that happens in the country, by respecting the other cultures. Because I think what's so amazing about America is that America is, is you know, it's a tight-knit patchwork of different cultures. And within this patchwork, it really is strong. We can all 
no matter what our culture is, celebrate. Celebrate who we are, eat our food, uh, practice our religion, sing our songs. Mm -hmm. And this is amazing. There is no country in the world that you can do that. And so as an immigrant coming into this, and I'm allowed to do that, but I also need to respect the major fabric that I'm part of by working and contributing and returning if I get into a position to do so. Other questions? Your students? Yes, please. What city do you think has the best real Italian food? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the, I think, I think the, where are the big uh, uh, communities? I, I think New York has some really good, and I think up in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, uh, yeah, I'm going, uh, I have a uh, grandson going to Providence, and I'm going to be speaking there Saturday, so I'm going up there, I'm looking forward. Federal Hill. What? Federal Hill. Federal Hill, of course. Yeah, yeah. So I think that, uh, let's see where else I, I travel. Now, St. Louis has a, a great Italian community, but that's Italian-American. Oh. So I'm, uh, you know, kind of, uh, let's see, Chicago again, but that's a, a Chicago-Italian kind of, it's interesting to see how each, you know, where the Italians settle and how the Italian-American cuisine is different. Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh yeah. yeah, has a big Italian community, absolutely. Question in the back, sir? Yes, with the... Yes, you... I think he has his mic there, so he... That's the mic, oh, I see, sorry with a microphone. Uh, hey, um, I just wanted to know what your biggest failure you would say in your career was in starting the restaurant that you I had. I can't hear you clearly. Can you mm -hmm. just straighten up the mic straight into your face? Um, I just wanted to know what your biggest failure you would say was in your career in starting your restaurant. What were the, I still couldn't Your remember. biggest failure? Biggest failure, uh oh. oh. The biggest <laughs> failure Ooh. in, I, I think you know, you have to be ready for failures, and you have to learn from, from failures. Uh, uh, I think, you know, we closed uh, two restaurants along the way. You know, we have, I don't know, 14 restaurants or whatever, but we did close two along the way. Uh, and, you know, uh, we, we got into something that we didn't know about enough about. One was a, a kind of a French bistro, and a chef said that he would do it. So I think that uh, those are my two biggest business failures. Uh, let's see. You know, uh, failures, especially in retrospect, are relative. They make you grow, so they're not, when you look back at it, they're not as bad as they are at the moment that they're happening. Uh, <laughs> so, so keep that in mind, you know, that uh, if you persevere, if you, in life, if you have uh, adversities, Learn, make, make yourself stronger because, because we all have them and it, 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 just, it just happens. Uh, what other failures? I mean, you know, regular failures that uh, uh, I guess in a normal life would happen. But those, I think, business-wise were our two major failures. Mm -hmm. This gentleman here in the yellow shirt's had his hand up. Can you, can you stand up and ask? Would you like a microphone? Yeah, I, I, I don't need a microphone. Okay. Uh, <laughs> are you going to make more TV shows? I, my wife, I, I get to watch my wife because she loves your TV shows. <laughs> you get all these shows and you go, hmm, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you get to taste a lot of good things on your show. Right. Are you going to make more TV? Because where we moved here in Athens, we can't get a stand. Okay. Oh. So, so I am in a 98% of PBS station across the United States. 98. So you have to call your PBS station if I'm not there and ask why, or maybe they have changed the scheduling. You might find a different scheduling. I'm also on Create, and that's, again, a PBS addendum uh, channel that goes on, I think, 24 hours and reruns shows. Um, it's, for me, it's 20 years that I'm on television, on PBS television. Um, <clears throat> I film 26 half-hour episodes every year, usually in the spring, and they are released now in October. So the new 
season of the new 26 shows will be released in October on your PBS station. And each station uh, kind of schedules it differently. And then it goes on for six months, and then it repeats itself, and by then I have 26 new ones. In addition to that, I do a one-hour special every year, again for PBS, which airs in December. Lydia Celebrates America, and I did two with veterans. I did uh, uh, one with all different ethnic marriages in America for different ethnicity, which was what I was talking about before, how all American we are, and the young people, and yet the weddings all had the undertones of their cultural back background, which was wonderful. Uh, so that should come out in the beginning of December. And uh, this year, I went around the United States, and uh, uh, I, I looked into mentorship, and because I think that you know there's not a culture of mentorship here, and I think uh, you know um, a, lo a lot of young people certainly get an education is number one, but not everybody is capable or, or has the money or can go on. And mentoring and the jobs that we all need. We all need a plumber. We all need a, an electrician. Uh, uh, we uh, so it's, so being an apprentice and learning a job in our industry. There's a lot of apprenticeship going on. You know, somebody could come in as a dishwasher and end up as a sous chef eventually if he gives himself the time or herself or the energy. So that's coming out in December. It should be a very interesting uh, show watch that, so you should see. But my, my show, not only is it in the United States, it airs in the Middle East, I think in 26 Arab countries. It uh, airs in Australia, it airs in Mexico, it airs uh, in, in Eastern Europe, uh, Croatia, and some of those countries. So, you know, it should be there. You have to find out why Athens PBS doesn't have me. Actually, from here, I go down to Atlanta tomorrow, and I do a fundraiser for, for, pub, uh, for Atlantic, Atlantic uh, Public Television. I do a lot of those. I just did one in Toledo. Uh, I just did one in Chicago. So I'm, I'm committed to that, and I, I, I should be someplace on their screen. Just find out from them when am I scheduled. Well, that's what I feel, you know. It's, it's my, my uh, uh, saying thank you and uh, my responsibility. You know, when you're given a chance, an opportunity, uh, and uh, you, you were blessed enough to, to reach a comfortable position, then giving back, I mean, it's, it's, it's a must. I just did, in Kansas City, we have a restaurant, just to mention a, a few things. And there I'm involved, because being in a city for me as a businesswoman also means being involved in the, in the, in the city itself. We did a fundraiser for Boys Grow. Boys Grow is a, a little organization uh, formed by a young man that had a vision, and uh, he makes opportunity for inner city uh, teenager boys for the summer to come to his farm, the farm. He then eventually fundraised, got a, got a piece of land, and he teaches these boys how to grow, how to seed, how to take care mm. of the land, how to, how to uh, 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 take care of the plant, ultimately harvest. Ultimately, out of that harvest, make a product. He right. does a salsa, he does a ketchup, and he teaches these young kids how to do the label, they designed the label, mm -hmm. and ultimately market it. And uh, you know, uh, I, I'm all for that. Every year, the first three years, we did the, the fundraising dinners at Lydia's Kansas City. Now it's become a big event, and we had over 300 people out on the farm, and it was just, just wonderful. I work, uh, I do events for the United Nations, as you said, mm -hmm. and um, uh, because I lived through a camp, and I know uh, children in camp, when they come out, refugee children, lose actually two years of education. They mm. come out two years behind. So the United Nations has this, this organization of funds where they build school within the camps, refugee camps, so that the children don't have to lose, that they can continue their education. So I do fundraising so that we can raise enough funds to build those schools in the refugee camps, not in the United States. Wherever they are, 
Yeah. Uh, so there's, there's a lot. Next week, there is a, a Jesuit refugee event. I am the honoree, and of course, fundraising and so on. Uh, uh, I'm involved in Arupe College. Arupe College, Chicago, is a, is a and it's coming, uh, the Arupe College is coming to, to uh, someplace in Atlanta. It's oh. a connection, I think, with the Loyola. And what it is, it's a wonderful program where uh, a two-year college is set up in conjunction with the Loyola University in mm. Chicago. And uh, it gives a chance, again, for inner city Chicago kids to go after high school, to be able to go at least to a two-year college to begin to continue their education. And what's amazing, this is five years, I'm on the board. We just, again, did a, a fundraiser there. We raised $2.4 million for them. And uh, what, what it, 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 uh, the, the results are five years. 60% of the enrolled uh, children graduated. 40% of that 60% went on to a four-year college. Oh. These are kids that could have never had the education. And you know, education is what gives you a chance in life. So yes, uh, being involved and giving back is very uh, dear and important for me. I have one more question. Uh, gentlemen, you've been standing up the whole, the whole time. Please, thank you. Thank you. So um, I just had like a simple question. What is your favorite dish to make? Favorite dish. <laughs> what is my favorite dish to make? You know, uh, that question, it depends a lot on the season and the product. You know, I resp as a chef, I respond to the product. You know, a lot of chefs are first inventive and then they go look for the product. My greatest joy in cooking is when I see something perfect and I'm going to cook that. I'm going to make it happen. And uh, uh, so, you know, whatever it's in season, whatever, but I think overall, if I was on a stranded island, pasta. Pasta. <laughs> well, Lydia, we so appreciate you being here. We have a small token oh, thank of you. appreciation. <laughs> Maybe not so small, but these are oh my foods goodness. from local foods. And we have a nice plaque here for you. Let me read this. Oh my this goodness. is one of your quotes, I believe. It says... Food is culture. Food is an, is an identity, a footprint of who you are. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. It identifies you. That's why it's so important for children, uh, young children, to be in the kitchen, to understand, to cook, because that gives them roots, Good. gives them solidity in life when they grow. Food identifies them. Well. My goodness, I have all kinds of goodies Good here. Stuff, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank really, you. Okay. So enjoy, so thank enjoyed you. your comments. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So I'm going to go up there and sign books if they want or whatever. I, I think. I'm